from Philippians. I felt led some time ago to go verse by verse through Philippians, and we'll try to get all the way through that. Uh, we'll not be in any big hurry, though. Last time we dealt with, I think, the first verse or so. This time we're going to kind of break the chapter, first chapter down into parts so that we can uh, see what its message is there and what the key is. So important to have a key to the scriptures. I have told you all along that our key to the scriptures and the Christ life is the birthing. That's the way we interpret and translate the scriptures. Now that comes across new to a lot of people because most people get the idea that uh, any way anybody presents the scriptures is the way it ought to be. But that's not so. There's a key that unlocks the truth of the scriptures for us today. And everybody who knows what they're doing has a key to the scriptures. You understand that? Everybody has a key to the scripture. A Jehovah Witness key to the scripture is, has to do with eschatology or the end time and the 144,000. And the Baptists have a key to the scripture uh, identified with their very name, water baptism. That's their key to the scripture. Uh, Pentecostals key to the scripture speaking in tongue. And Charismatics key to the scripture is man becoming something within himself, gifted apostles, prophets, and so forth. Uh, everybody has a key to the scriptures. Our key to the scriptures is the birthing. We take it from Jesus' words to Nicodemus when he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you must be born again. It is at that moment that I see the whole of God's plan focused, crystallized under one understanding. That understanding is that until you are rebirthed, you are not in this day and time what it is God intended that you be. And so that's, that's very simple, isn't it? Of course, everybody says, well, we believe that, but that's not all there is to it. But that's the starting point. That's the foundation. That's the beginning point. You must be born again. And that's key to everything God is doing. Now, those that were used by God in the scriptures were all used according to time element. In the first chapter of Philippians, we are faced with the issue that Paul is no longer operating as the great apostle uh, equal to Peter or equal to John or James or any of the other apostles. Uh, his business is not church establishment. His ministry now is a servant, and that's the way he begins, as a servant of God. What has happened to him is that he has preached for some years and established churches and has done the will and the work of the Lord, and now the time has come that he's arrested and he's in prison. Actually, he is in a rented house with a Roman guard literally chained to him so that he has a bit of liberty to move around on his own in his own place, but he's still a prisoner. But he doesn't recognize himself as a prisoner of Rome. He recognizes himself as a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ and carries that theme through. Now, uh, it is very important that we have a feeling for when the scriptures are given to us or are written. It, it necessitates, if we understand what God is saying in the scriptures, that we start at the beginning. And I'm not going to take a long discourse on that tonight because I really want to talk to you from, from the first chapter of Philippians. But to tell you how Paul got into prison and how a remarkable change came to him, we have to start with some scriptures that will help us to see or to know this. And so I'm going to point out a thing or two to you that might help you. The Bible begins with the words in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. Well, a lot of people like to stop right there because that's really where the beginning is. In the beginning, God. But what it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we've got a place right now where we see in, in Genesis 1 and 1 that God has created the heavens and the earth. The next verse, however, is separated from this first verse by perhaps billions of years. Don't know that, but uh, since I don't know, I could put a big figure on it. 
Genesis 1 and 2 says, and God created. The second verse says that the earth was void and without form. Well, from the time he created the heavens and the earth to over here at Genesis 1 and 2 is no telling how long a period of time. And I always like to comment. People wonder where the dinosaurs and all of this. We're in the dinosaur era right now uh, out in the world. Everybody's talking about dinosaurs and the kids, kids have been to see dinosaur movies and so forth. But that may be where they took place from the time God created the heavens and the earth to this period right here, which is the fall. At the fall, this earth was wiped clean, and God had to come back and create what it is that's on the earth now, and what he created that's on the earth now fits the plan for which we live, the plan that we operate in. Well, what I want to show you is something important. There are six times in the scriptures where a certain terminology is used that's very important. Our key verse for this is Ephesians 1 and 4. What Ephesians 1 and 4 says is, according as he has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. Well, that's very important. That term, before the foundation of the world, is used six times in the scripture according to my calculation. That's really the most important term and idea for you and I as Gentiles to be found in the whole of the scriptures. But we may have missed that. There are many other scriptures that talk about from the foundation of the world. In fact, I think there are at least 14 scriptures that say that something happened from the foundation of the world. I ask that you mark in Ephesians 1 and 4 that word before because that's a key, that's a key term. That's the key to uh, what it is God is doing, in fact. But then let's just uh, choose another verse of scripture, one of our other prime texts, Revelation 13 and 8. If you will, turn to Revelation 13 and 8. And I want you to see something in this verse. It says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names were not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Would you circle that word from? What I want to do is tell you the difference between the word before and the word from. That word from is what took place here. From the foundation of the world. Not back in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. That term is used, let's say, 10 times. I'm not certain about that. I think there's 14 times that it's used, but I haven't separated all of them according to these words. Now, why have I made this distinction? Because everything God did from the foundation of the world was aimed at one big event, and that was Calvary. One big event was what God was after. Well, from the foundation of the world, God planned that the lamb would be slain, that Christ would die for the sins of the people. But that comes from the foundation of the world. That doesn't come from the word before, before the world was created. Now, why do I make a point of that? Because in the scriptures, there was a time where God's message before the foundation of the world was what ruled and motivated God's plan. For instance, back here before the fall, God had a single plan that said, I'm going to create a creature 
and I'm going to put a part of myself in that creature, and that creature will please me by that. Well, that was set aside. That great idea was set aside because when the fall came and the overthrow at God's house took place by Lucifer, then it was necessary that God set up another plan. And his plan was that I'm going to create man now and prove to man that he cannot please me within himself. And so we had the, the dispensations. We had innocence. We had conscience. We had human governments. We had the dispensation of promise. And then we had law, the dispensation of law. All of these periods are derived from the foundation of the world. An entirely different time period than where God said, I choose creatures to be in Christ. Well, the law was the final means by which God would bring people to the fullness of Christ. And so at Calvary, Christ died for the sins of the world and there was released in God's plan an event to take place at Pentecost whereby the Holy Spirit would come and would begin to teach men something very important, the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Well, that was missed. That was not known at all. But God went ahead with his plan. And after Pentecost, we have a period called the Acts period. The Acts period lasted for, I'm not for sure how many years, uh, from the day of Pentecost to the end of the Acts period was probably about 62 years that this book historically covered a time period. It is very interesting though that in all of this time period, God had chosen him a people. Chosen, that's a key word. He had chosen him a people that would glorify and honor his name. He had given them all of these time periods to prove or given them the opportunity to prove that they loved him because that's all God ever wanted was somebody to love him. Well, they fail. Christ died for our sins. And during the period of the book of Acts, God still deals with this chosen people. He's still dealing with Israel. All during the book of Acts. Well, that's important that we understand that. Because God's whole purpose was to prove to mankind that his way of doing things was much better. And man had a hard time accepting what it was God was doing. But at the end of the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 28 and verse 28, he says that he has blinded Israel, deafened her ears that she couldn't hear, and that now the gospel will go to the Gentiles. Well, that's rather significant. Because up until that time, the gospel that the world had was based on Israel. Uh, it was based on law. It was based on a chosen people. But all of a sudden, in the scriptures, through the Apostle Paul, God begins to bring forth another message. This other message is a message that goes from this period at the end of Acts all the way over here before the foundation of the world. That message is known as the mystery of godliness. That was God's purpose from the very beginning. Thus, there were five times in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul says that what God was doing from before the foundation of the world was never known in this time period. Never known. Nobody knew it. 
We sit here in this room and talk about things that upset people, like tithing and like you have to go to church when the doors open or you're not a good Christian or something out of doer religion or law. And people probably wonder, well, how in the world you come to that? How, uh, what's your basis for all of that? Our basis for that is the rightful division or dividing of the Word of God. Paul said you had to do that. Sooner or later, you've got to rightfully divide the Word of God. Why? Because not all of it has to do with what God is doing in your life. So, we now see something important. Over here, beyond the book of Acts, the Acts period, beyond the book of Acts, beyond about the year 60 or 64 A.D., there were seven epistles written. These seven epistles are what it is we're studying now. The seven epistles that take place beyond the book of Acts are what we call the prison epistles. The apostle Paul has been arrested and he's now a prisoner. A prisoner, he says, of Jesus Christ, but he's a prisoner of Rome too. And during that time he's a prisoner, he writes seven epistles. They are Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, Philemon, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and Titus. He writes all seven of these epistles while he's in prison. There is a notable thing about these epistles, especially Philippians that we're studying now. In these epistles, the Apostle Paul never mentions anything that took place in this time period. It's as if they didn't exist. It exists, it's as if there had never been an Israel. He never mentions a message to Israel in the prison epistles. He never mentions Jesus of Nazareth outside of his death, burial, and resurrection in the seven prison epistles. Well, see, that's different. That's radically different. That's even different from his first seven epistles. His first seven epistles, which were written in this Acts period, are Romans, Galatians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and Hebrews. Those epistles were written during what we call the Acts period. But at the end of the Acts period, God ceases to deal with Israel. He sets them aside. Now, can you understand that? Can you understand a Bible where Israel is set aside? Uh, look at Acts 28 and 28. Actually, we need to look at verse 27. It says, for the heart of this people, Israel, for the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their, their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Now, be it known, Underline that word. Be it known, therefore, unto you that the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles and that they will hear it. That's plain enough, isn't it? What he has said here is that in all of his dealings with the chosen people, he stops. He's not going to deal with Israel anymore. He's not going to deal with the Jew anymore. He's not going to deal with the rights and the privileges, the commands and the laws that had to do with the Jew. These were his chosen people who in this time period all the way from Genesis 1 and 2 through the book of Acts were God's chosen people. But a chosen people was never his purpose. 
His whole purpose was to have a rebirth, people. The birthing. Why is it we're so strong on the law? Because the law comes with a people who were chosen, created by God, but not birthed by God. You see that difference? There is a big difference between those who have been created by God and those that are birthed by God. Now, until Paul went to prison, God's whole dealing in the scriptures was first and foremost to Israel. There's even a statement where it says the gospel should be preached to the Jew first. God's whole dealing was with Israel. Even after Pentecost, throughout the entire book of Acts, God's dealing was with Israel. For a long time, I agitated over the fact that Dr. Luke only has, I think, one statement of in Christ's position in his whole book. And that bothered me because he traveled with Paul and he knew that. Then why did it happen like that? I could see that God was still dealing with Israel. Peter's great sermon on the day of Pentecost was directed primarily at Israel. We preach it. All Pentecostal churches base their relationship with God on it. But that whole sermon was directed at a chosen people, not at a birth people. And so God gave rules and laws. To this chosen people. What was wrong with them? They didn't have God's nature in them. Created by God in his image and likeness, but they came into the world with a Satan nature in them. They needed to be born again, but the only way they could please God short of being born again was to do everything God said to do. To do everything God said to do. Are you listening to me now? Hear this. You make a choice in your understanding of God whether or not you are living by trying to do everything you can do to please God or whether you know what it means to be rebirthed and that you're his child, not by anything you do, but by who you are. You see the difference in that? That's why somebody's always throwing the book at us over law because they don't understand that there was a time God dealt with people who needed laws. They didn't have God's spirit. They didn't have God's nature. They didn't have Christ in them. That had been hidden from, from them. But the only way they could please God and come to righteousness was by obedience. They all had a big problem obeying God, but that's the only way they could ever come to God's righteousness. So there's a great difference between the created creature and the rebirthed one, the one who is born again. So the birthing was what God had in mind before the foundation of the world, that he would place in the creature another. But that was unknown until way over here past the Acts period, till Paul went to prison. Then it was that the gospel was sent to the Gentile. So the next time somebody comes to you and says, well, don't you believe in a little bit of law? Have some understanding for what they're saying. Preachers wanting to debate me all the time up in New England. He says, you got to have a little bit of law to make grace work. But somehow... The Holy Spirit will help us to see the division of the scriptures because what was spoken to this created people is not spoken to the rebirth. What God said to Israel is not said to the Gentile. What God said before the end of the Acts period in the scriptures and what he says after when Paul goes to prison are two different messages. You make your choice by your understanding as to what you believe. You can see there's a lot more to go into on this subject, and we'll try to enlighten us on it as the Holy Spirit allows in time to come. But Paul is finally in prison. When he gets to prison, there's no more message to the Jew. 
So there's no more mention of tithing. There's no more mention of keeping the law. There's no more mention of anything that is contrary to our creation. And I think Paul uses that term, seems like he uses it at least twice and maybe more. I need to search that out. But he loves the word contrary, and that word's become important to me now because anything in our life that's contrary to Christ in us is an, is an offense to us. It works against us. Anything in your life that's contrary to Christ in you works against you. Well, that kind of takes us into the first chapter of Philippians, and we're going to pick out a word here, and that's what we're going to dwell on tonight. In Philippians 1 and 21, we have this very precious verse that says, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Now, I've never known how much influence to put on this verse. I've never known exactly what to say about it uh, because it's such a powerful verse that goes beyond all comprehension that it's hard for me to know exactly just how much stress to put on this one verse. But the facts are, if we took it as it is literally written, we would come up with this. It would read like this. He says, I live because I am Christ. To live is Christ. To live is to be Christ. Now, it's hard language, isn't it? Don't run around saying you're Christ. Somebody will misunderstand you, but that's what he's saying here. He says, for me to be alive at all, it is Christ. Well, that fits Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live Yet not I, Christ liveth in me. And so he's saying it in other words here. He says, the only way I am alive is by Christ. Christ in me. Therefore, for me to die in the flesh or in body is gain. See, that's almost identical to Galatians 2.20 because he says, I am dead with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, it's not I that live, it's Christ who liveth in me. So he says to live is Christ. For me to be alive is Christ. No other way to live other than as Christ. And he says to die is gain. Now there's no end of ideas that we could put to that verse of Scripture. But with that verse of Scripture as the center of what it is that's being said in this first chapter, I draw at least seven things from it. I put in my notes at least seven important things in this first chapter of Philippians that helps you to enter in to a death whereby out of that death flows his life. Out of your death comes his life. Now, don't sit here while I'm doing all this and try to think how you can die to self. If you do, you're being robbed of the greatest truths out of Romans 6 because Romans 6 says you're already dead. You don't need to die to something. You're already dead to it. You need to fix it in your mind. You need to reckon it so. You need to say that's so. That's true. That's so. You're already dead to it. See, that's the miracle. That's what's helping a lot of people. And I had a lady this past week, can't remember where I was, but I had a lady in, in the last week or so who got a hold of Floyd's testimony. And uh, she got that thing just like Floyd says it in his testimony. She says, I reckon myself so. I reckon that that was so. And a great trial moved out of her life. And you should have heard her testimony. Because you see, you have the power to live above natural living, natural life, natural things, secular things, sinful things, because you died already at the cross. You're already dead. And the moment you reckon that so, you are left with his power and his life alone. 
I no longer exist. It's him. Then you can say to habits. Then you could say to problems. Then you can say to enemies, you're licked because I speak as Christ. I speak in the name of Jesus as Christ. You see that? Well, I'd like to divide this first chapter of Philippians into uh, seven parts and uh, get to maybe as many as we can in this session. In verse 8, we read, For God is my record, and how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Now, I pick that verse out while your mind is fresh because I want you to mark that you all there. You see, he was a Texan. I always knew there was something special about Paul, and there it is right there. In fact, I think he says that twice in this first chapter. So it was a deep thing in him. He is, he is culturated already, the right kind of culture. Now, he says, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. First thing he says here is, if Christ is my life, then I have his character. Deep down inside of me, he's saying, I have his character. I have his characteristics. I have his nature flowing out of me. Now, that's the first thing you fit in your mind from Philippians 1 and 21. If Christ is your life, if indeed for you to live is Christ, the first thing he says becomes important to you is that everything that was deep inside of Christ, in the bowels of Christ. Everything deep in Christ is in you. In you. You have his character. You have his characteristics. There's no way better I can show that than to show you how that when you were created by God in his likeness, and his image, Christ fitted. Here you are as a spirit being, perfect circle, and when God put Christ in you, he fits you just perfectly. He fits into your creation. Well, we're not all perfect circles. Some of us are like that. But Christ in us fits just exactly what we are. Some of you are a little more square, but Christ in you fits just exactly what you are. He fits your creation. So Paul is saying here that the Christ that is in you, the Christ that is your life, his very character fits your creation. Now we all have the fuzzy notion that Christ is going to come out of us like we dream or like we say from the scriptures or like somebody else says, Christ ought to come out of us. And I think this is one of the hardest bridges for you to cross in your walk with God. The understanding that Christ is going to come out of you like God created you. That his characteristics fit your creation. They don't fit the way you've been doing things. And so the way you've been doing things sort of has to be set aside. We're going to really bear down on that truth when we get to the third chapter of Philippians because Paul says, everything that made me me, I have set aside. I've discounted. I've discounted it. Now, the hardest thing you'll ever do is to discount what it is that's made you what you are up until now because most everything that's made you what you are up until now did not fit your creation because it emanated from the sin nature that was in you. Now the sin nature is out, but you still got that same old mind. And in order for you to become what it is you ought to be, you've got to change your mind about some things. And the place that it starts is that I have Christ in me so his characteristics are going to spontaneously come out of me. I'm going to give a mind to that. 
How do you know what his characteristics are? By giving your mind to the Christ that is within you. Most of us have never lived the life God created us to live because we give a mind to the Christ that's in us that we want him to have. We want to be nice like Grandma said to be or nice like Papa said to be or nice like some preacher said to be. But could you ever rest in the fact that you've got a whole new life and new world in front of you and that Christ in you, his characteristics, can just flow out of you spontaneously? Could you rest in that and let him begin to flow? You might make a few mistakes. You may have a hard time with that for a little while. It may take a long time before it looks good to you and to others. But if Christ is really your life, if you really see I'm dead and the life I now live is Christ, if you ever get that fixed in your mind, then his character is going to come out of you. It's going to come out of you like you are. Now, do you understand that? Let's say Jesus is an is a Englishman. And so when he comes out, he'll come out as English. No, he'll come out like you are. If you're a, a Mexican, he'll come out of you like a Mexican. He comes out of you like you are. That's the miracle of this salvation. That's what religion kept us from doing. That's what we're so, why we're so hard on religion in this place. Because religion keeps us from being what God created us to be. It has to because it doesn't understand that it is Christ in us that's our hope of glory. Not going to church, not reading our Bible, not praying. And we do all those things and love them. But that's not what makes us who we are. So, fulfilling verse 21 here, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. The first point is that if Christ is really my life, then I have his character in me. Let's take that one step further. That means that with Christ in you, you have the character or the ability to do what is right innately in you. Now, you know what that can mean? That means that as you renew your mind with the fact that Christ is in you, everywhere you go, you'll, and whatever you do, you'll never have to make a decision about doing right. It's your character. It's his character as you. You spontaneously do what is right. Often somebody comes to me and they say, well, I'm a Christian, but I just can't stop doing wrong. They don't know who they are yet. Because who they really are for me to live is Christ. For that idea to work, who they really are has a character in them that pleases God. You've got that in you right now. In your life, are the unmanifested, unmanifested character traits of Jesus Christ. Where is your growth? To give a mind to him. And in time, those character traits will come out sp spontaneously. It'll never enter your mind to violate it. It'll just work. Doing what is right will be a subconscious action to you because your whole consciousness is full of the fact that Christ lives in you. Well, look at verse 12. Verse 12 says, But I would that you should understand, brethren, that the things which have happened unto me have fallen rather out to the furtherance of the gospel. I've always uh, loved this verse. Let me read verse 13 with it. So that my bonds in Christ are manifested in all the palace and in all other places. I love this, uh, uh, these two scriptures because they tell us something very important about Paul. Uh, the people in the New Testament that went to prison 
considered it a place to wait before God, to seek God, and to allow God to get them out. Uh, Peter and John had that experience when they went to the prison and the uh, jail doors fell off the hinges. Uh, the Apostle Paul had that experience here where God was going to take care of him, and he knew that. He knew that in a very straightened circumstance, God would take care of it. See, we all like to talk about that, but when we get in a bad circumstance, we don't really uh, believe it. We start looking for somebody to pray and have faith uh, uh, to get us out of this mess, somebody to really believe with us and all of that. We kind of revert back to the law area where you had to do something to please God. You had to be a doer and couldn't be a beer. Those that are those that are before the foundation of the world are beers. They can be what God wanted them to be because he doesn't put law on them to do to be. Well, you have a beautiful story here from Paul. The Apostle Paul is saying in this instance, don't pray for me. Now, the saints were always praying for a miracle. Uh, they, had, they had great miracles in those days also, just like we have some today. And he was, he was in God's will in prison, and he said the gospel has been forwarded by me in this place. You see his, you see his very wording here? He says that the things which have happened to me have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. And he says, my bonds in Christ, not my bonds to the Roman soldier, not my, my being tied, as it were, chained or handcuffed to the Roman soldier, but he said, my bonds, my, my being linked to Christ, one with Christ, has become known all over this place. In the palace. It is known where the potentates are. And he said in all other places. What did they know in all other places? That this man was in Christ. He said, don't pray for me to get out of prison. I'm reaching souls here. You know, it's a marvelous thing about the, the fellows we have in prison in, in, uh, that have been reading our material and growing with us some for years. Uh, they never talk about pray now to get me out of prison. They'll say once in a while, pray for my family, pray for my wife, uh, but they never pray to get out of prison because all of them have learned from this message that going to prison was a key that changed their life. That was important. That thing that happened to them became an important thing to bring them to a knowledge of who they were in Christ. There are a lot of people, a lot of good Christian people that can't get over the hump of things that have happened to them. They can't see that those bad things that happened to them were really good if they come to a knowledge of who they are in Christ. If they don't get the gospel preached to them and don't come to a knowledge of who they are in Christ, then they feel real bad about it. And they say, well, God didn't answer prayer. Nobody prayed, and, and I don't know why I had to go through that. And the worst thing is he'll probably go through that and something worse again. Paul said, don't pray for me to get out of prison. My message, my gospel is known in the palace. Well, if he had set up a gospel tent outside the, the parade grounds of the palace, he wouldn't have made near as much headway as being in prison, chained to Christ, bound to Christ. And he said, it's gotten known that Christ and I are one. It's not only known in the palace, but in all other places. Think about that. What's the greatest power you have as a witness? Kneeling somebody down, leading them to Christ? That's wonderful. But that's not your greatest power. Your greatest power is living this Christ that is in you, living it before your family, before your loved ones, before the people on the job, fellow down at the grocery store and the filling station, living who you are. He said, gloriously, I've spread the gospel by being one in Christ. The gospel's been feathered. I'm trying to get this across to our people everywhere. I got a lot of people who won't come back to the Christ life because they say, well, you don't have us doing anything. You know what they want to do? They want to do something because they feel guilty. Guilty people have got to do something. 
they got to build buildings, they got to raise money, uh, they've got to uh, be at the Lord's work, they have to have their nose on the grindstone. They can't be free yet. They can't live free yet. They can't say Christ is my all yet because they have to do these things to be who they are. But your greatest power is living the Christ that's in you. Not trying to live him. I think the world sees through that. That's why they call us hypocrites. They see us trying so hard to be good, and then they say, well, you did something wrong. You're not any better than anybody else. They didn't see Jesus. They saw us trying to be good. They saw us praying. They saw us reading our Bible. They saw us being religious. They saw us trying to be spiritual. They didn't see Jesus. Paul said, I'm bound to Christ. Look at his very wording that he uses here. He says that my bonds in Christ so that my bonds, my chaining to Christ, my bonds in Christ are manifested in all the palace. It means something else. It means that even though he was chained to a Roman guard, even though he was chained to a Roman guard, he said, when people see me in this guard together, they see Christ coming out of me in this chained relationship. You know, one of the greatest blessings I've ever had as a minister, it's when I knew somebody was dying in the hospital, and I'd go see them, and they'd cheer me up. They'd have the right word. They'd not mention their situation. They would see me down and out, and I've had several of them take me by the hand and say, Pastor, let me pray for you. He said, they see me chained to this Roman guard. That's my bad circumstance. But he said, that's a Christ thing. That's a Christ thing. That's C. Thur's experience. You got to learn to see through it all to Christ. Paul says, I want them to see through me chained to this Roman guard to see Christ. I want them to see through me being in prison to see Christ. He so said, That's what's happening. They see through this to Christ. But that's not my point. My point is that he's really given us a couple of views of the same situation that he is, that he's in. On one hand, he says, I have the same interest that Christ has. My interest is at all times to express him. And so he says, I'm not angry. I'm not bitter. I'm not going to complain about this circumstance and situation. That was one viewpoint that he had. The other viewpoint he had was that the saints should not be upset because of me. Let's uh, read on a little bit further here in this, uh, in this uh, verse to see something that I think is, is, uh, that, that kind of explains that. Uh, at verse 14, and many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add to my affliction, add to, uh, to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. What a testimony. What is he saying here? His second point is, because Christ is my life, he says it doesn't matter what circumstance I'm in, how bad it looks, how awful it is, Christ is coming forth. Christ is coming forth. 
Now, dear friends, we're going to have to grow into that as believers. That's what our message is all about. Whatever your circumstance, you can spend your time blaming it on the devil and say, oh, the old devil's doing this and I'm not going to get him victory. You know what you're doing by that? You're stealing the virtue from the Christ that's within you. It may be the devil, but when you start seeing Jesus and see through your circumstance to Christ, there's no devil big enough to stay in that situation. you got to see through it. So Paul says another thing here. He says that this has not only been a means by which I've spread the gospel, and they've seen me in this bad circumstance as a Christ person, but he said, many of my brethren have gotten encouraged by this. They see me in Christ, and they're out preaching harder on the streets, in the churches, in the homes. They're preaching it as never before. They've gotten bold. Hallelujah. They've gotten bold. When we see a brother that goes to a bad situation, that same thing happens to us. If he sees Christ as his life in his bad situation, he becomes a strength to every one of us. They say, well, look how bad he is and Christ is being forwarded. I'll get out. I'm alive. I'm not arrested. I'm not chained to a Roman guard. I'm not in a bad circumstance. I can with freedom speak the word of the Lord boldly. And if they arrest me, can't be any worse than Paul. If they kill me, to die is gain. That's Christ alive. If Christ really lives in you, you're going to use every bad circumstance in your life as a means to bring forth Christ. Now, don't misinterpret what I'm saying. Don't go out looking for some bad thing to happen to you so you can be righteous and holy. You don't have to. Just spontaneously go every day alive in Christ. Live every day. Get up every morning saying, Lord, this is your day, and you're going to find you have enough days with bad events in them. You're going to have enough weeks that are the worst you ever had. You may have a year that's worse than any other of your years, but you're going to be victorious. You're not going to be defeated, and you can't be defeated, praise God. You're going to be vibrantly alive by the Christ that is in you. Praise God. Praise God. Well, let's go to the third point here. In verse 19, he says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now he introduces prayer to us. How important this is. If Christ is really my life, then the Spirit of Christ is going to work and is going to flow and is going to come through me. Praise be to God. It's just going to work like that. The Spirit of Christ. Now, this is your innermost life. When you talk about the Spirit of Christ, you're talking about the innermost life that you have. In the innermost life of Christ in you, you're going to have his motives and his aims. I don't know how exactly to get this across to you. To have his motives and his aims is sort of hard on us because I teach on one hand that it is Christ fulfilling your creation to be who you are, and on the other hand, to carry out his motives and his aims. So lest you don't understand, I want to separate something for you here. The manifestation of Christ out of your life is going to be as God created you, like you are. But to have his motives and his aims is going to be something that's fixed in your mind. Like, you're going to say, Jesus wouldn't do that, so I don't do that. Jesus wouldn't go there, so I don't go there. 
His aim was to please the Father. So at every turn, my whole desire and ambition is to pre please my Heavenly Father and to be what it is He would have me to be. So you see, you're going to carry out His aims and motives as you are. It's like this. We're going to go to Seattle. And uh, our aim is to get to Seattle. But there are two ways to go to Seattle. Plunker's going to go to Seattle through Ellensburg. And Floyd's going to go to Seattle across the mountain here. Which way is that? White Pass. White Pass. They're going to have the same destination. They're going to the same place. But they're two different creatures. And so God will allow them to reach Seattle each through their own way of doing things. Now, they both got the same aim. They both got the same motive to get to Seattle. But God's going to allow them to go the way they want to go since there's two definite passes they could go over, two different ones, to get to Seattle from here. That's the way your life is. That's why we fight stereotyping believers. I don't want all of you dressed alike. I don't want all of you fix your hair alike. I don't want all of you driving the same kind of car or living in the same kind of home. I want you to be what God created you to be. But Paul says that you should have in your mind the same motive, the same aim that anybody else has that knows Christ. You can do it your way, but you should have the same aim. Now, I'm going to tell you something about religion. Religion won't permit this. Religion won't let you be you. Religion says we've got to all do it the same or else we don't reach the same goal. Well, you've got to be careful at a point that the goal is not somebody else's goal. The goal has to be your goal. What is your determination for your life? What is your aim in life? Is it your aim in life? to please the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and body, if that's your aim, then God's going to let you do it the way he created you. Now, how do we work that out? Very simple. You work that out. Let's take a husband and a wife. They're two extremely different people. One thing that happened to human beings is they keep looking for somebody that's like them or somebody that they can get along with the same. But you know, somehow that's not working today. God seems to have clamped down on human relationship. And while two people may go together a little while and have a, have a, a relationship for a little while, when they get married, they seem to go in opposite directions. Fifty percent of marriage is breaking up in America these days. What's wrong? Because they tried to make their aims and motives the same without seeing Christ in each other. You're not the same as your mate, but if you can see Christ in your mate, the aims will eventually be the same. The goals, the motives, the purpose will be the same. That's why Paul taught to not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What's an unbeliever? Somebody that doesn't see what it is Christ is doing. What is his ultimate end? That I grow up into him. That I come into his full stature. That my whole aim in life is daily becoming more and more what the Lord had had me to be. I said to Robbie the other day that I don't think there's a time in my life that I've ever felt growth of myself any more than I have the last few months. 
just real growth. I don't think anybody else can see it. They may think I'm regressing. But for me, I have just felt stronger in the Lord. I felt him stronger, given up more to him than ever before. Our purpose in life is to see Jesus in each other and let each person then reach their motives, their aims, and their goals as God has created. Well, I think I ought to take a break right here. <clears throat> yep. Where it is based on the 21st verse that says, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Now, if Christ is really our life, then our de deepest desire will be that he might be revealed and magnified. The verse for this is the 20th verse. Look at the 20th verse in this first chapter. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. What a testimony. What a powerful testimony. If Christ is really our life, then our deepest desire, Paul says, is that Christ might be revealed and magnified in our body, whether by life or by death. Now, do you understand what that statement says? It doesn't say that I want to magnify Christ in my body. He says my, my, my greatest desire, deepest desire, is that all of my manifestation might be Christ and not me. I want to magnify Christ and not me. Now this is an important thing, I think, for folks that are growing up in Christ. It's a very tedious point for some people to handle, but maybe you can handle it here. It isn't Christ, if it isn't Christ that does, what you do, then Christ isn't all to you. In your thinking, it should be everything I do is Christ. Now that doesn't mean if somebody walks up to you and says, well, where do you been? You don't look at them and say, well, Christ went downtown. Because you see, that's a misunderstood statement and a, not a good way to say it. But the fact is, it was Christ as you that went to town. So what needs to be in your thinking is that everything you do is Christ. Back in the Gospels, it is said we do all things in Jesus' name, or we do all things as unto the Lord. Now, to do all things in Jesus' name in the light of the in Christ message means that everything I do, I do because Christ is my life, and now he is my only life. Paul says that the important thing is to him that Christ would be manifest with all boldness. I want to mag magnify Christ in my body. And he draws the greatest extremes. He says whether I live or whether I die, I want Christ manifested in my very body. There's a lot of people get off base, I think, in understanding God's plan over body. The Apostle Paul was very keen that the believer who had a renewed mind could bring his body under subjection. In uh, Romans 7, he says there are motions of sin in his body, a statement he uses. He says it is a body of sin in Romans 7. I think in 1 Corinthians 15, he says it is a corruptible body, waiting for the resurrection morning when this corruptible will put on incorruption. This corruptible body will gain an incorruptible body. 
So the first viewpoint you have a body is that it is a corruptible body. Now what does it mean by that? Not bad, but it is corruptible in that it is not intended to be redeemed. The body is not intended to be regenerated. And as I said, there are a lot of people get off base over the body because we have some folks who believe that the body is being redeemed. They're the never die people. Do you ever run into any of those? We don't have so many of them today because most of them have died. But uh, there are people who believe that we are coming into faith and that as we grow in faith, we will come to where we never die in our bodies. That just like our soul is being saved, our body is being saved. Well, you want to remember uh, the theology of, of the tripartite man. Our spirit is saved, eternally saved right now. Our soul is being saved. Our bodies will be saved on the resurrection morning when this corruptible puts on incorruption. So that's the way it works. Paul says, whether I live or die, I want to magnify Christ in my body. Now, that's hard for people to do. We've gone through a, an age in our day when the faith ministries were real strong. The faith ministries had as their focal point, I believe, the fact that you glorified God only with a healthy body. And if you were sick and didn't get your healing, it's because you didn't have faith or you had sin in your life and God couldn't heal you. Uh, both of those ideas are contrary to the Christ life because I see God healing, as somebody has said in this meeting here today, I guess Frank said it, that God heals sinners. I've seen a number of them heal who had no intention of serving God uh, they didn't say they didn't love God or didn't pray to God. They believed there was a God, but they, they were not born again. They weren't saved, but, but God did a wonderful thing for them. And I've seen that lots of times. I saw that in prayer lines that uh, I could pray for unbelievers and God and heal them. They, they believed in healing. They believed God could heal, but they weren't saved. They weren't his, they weren't his children per se. Uh, there are a lot of people who believe that if you don't glorify God in your body by having a perfect body, then you don't have faith, or you may not really be a child of God. Paul is saying the very opposite here. He's saying that whether I live or die, I want to glorify God in my body. In other words, I don't want to touch anything. I don't want to have to do with anything that is contrary to Christ being my all. I wonder how you could handle this. You have cancer in your body. Could you magnify the Lord with cancer in your body? Could you glorify God if you were eaten up with disease? Could you glorify God if you were a hopeless cripple, maybe a quadri quadriplegic? Is that it? Could you glorify God through that? Paul said, it doesn't make any difference whether I'm alive or dead. I want to glorify God in this body. If I really and truly say Christ is my life, then I can glorify him whether I live or whether I die. That's an awesome thought. You see, that's a different way of living. That's fourth dimensional. That means that you have moved from this third dimension where I must be something on this level. I must be alive to be me. I must be good for you to like me. I must be something on this level. Paul says, no, that's not my level. My level is horizontal. I'm in another dimension of living, and it doesn't matter whether I live or die. I'm going to magnify God even with my body. I'm one with him in spirit. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. My mind is being quickened and renewed by his word and by the Holy Spirit's teaching. Now, last of all, he says, I'm chained to a Roman guard. I don't look like a liberated saint at all, but I am. 
I don't look like I have a great testimony of faith and power, but I do. And he said, I want to magnify God in my body whether I live or die. I hope you're getting uh, something out of this because this has always been a very rich portion of Scripture to me. A man is in jail. He knows he's going to die. That's why death is so predominant in these words. Our text says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And now this verse of Scripture says, I want to magnify Christ in my body whether I live or die. He is a man who has no outward testimony that would fit in our faith world. It wouldn't fit in our holiness world. It wouldn't fit in our sanctimonious church world. He's chained to a Roman guard. He's destined to die. And yet he says there's only one purpose in my life, and that is in my circumstance and situation to glorify God. I want us to come to that. My greatest sorrow would be when we have the passing of a loved one in the Christ life. My greatest sorrow would be that they fail Christ in death. That they failed him. I'd want their last words to be, Father, I'm coming home. I would never want it to be sorrow. Have you heard so much in this message that your faith is not turned toward your father? That you're ready to go? You're ready to die? Are you ready to face a wheelchair? Are you ready to face a bedfast end of your life? Are you ready to glorify God in your body? You see, your circumstances and situations are yet ahead of you. They're yet to come. We're not going to all go in a twinkling of an eye. We're going to have some circumstances and situations ahead for us yet. Why don't you get it fixed in your mind right now? I want to glorify God in my body. I don't want to grumble and gripe. Sure, I haven't taken care of my body. Probably didn't eat right. Didn't exercise right. I probably failed God in a lot of ways but I've been raised in grace. I don't use grace as a license to do these things. Maybe if I had it all to do over, I'd do it differently. But whatever I am in body, I want to glorify the Lord. Because you see, salvation doesn't hinge on body. It hinges on Him who is our life. On the resurrection morning, you get a new body. Then remember one other thing that's important about Paul's message uh, in body, and that's where he said we groan to get out of these bodies. Nothing wrong with that. So something happens to this old body and it gets knocked down a notch. Hair start coming out of the head, head. Eyes get a little weaker and limbs get a little stronger. Hearing gets a little weaker. And we sense that coming. We sense that happening to us, a little weakness in the body. Ah, we groan to get out of these bodies. But he said, I want to glorify God in my body as long as I'm in it. That doesn't stop me from wanting to get out of it. But as long as I'm here, I'll glorify him. I'll say he's leader, he's boss, he's life. He's in charge. Point number five. Verse 23. For I am in a strait, twinks two, having a desire to depart, to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful to you. Two verses. What powerful verses they are. If Christ is really your life, you'll have no other interest in life bigger than him. 
if you're going to buy a new house, Christ's interest in the house is what motivates you. If you buy an automobile, it's Christ's interest in the automobile. If you go shopping, it's Christ's interest in what you buy. If you go to family reunion, it's Christ's interest in these people, his interest in them. That's what you see. That's what you keep in front of you. Just like it is with your children that you're raising, you keep their interest in front of you at all times, and you deal with them on that basis. You should learn to deal with God on the basis of your interest in him and his interest in you. Here he says in this 23rd verse, that I'm in a strait. Now, you can call that a kind of a frustration, but I don't believe it is. I think it's a quandary. I think he's literally saying here that there's something I don't know. And what it is I don't know is, is it better for me to depart to be with Christ, or is it better to stay here with you? Now, we're kind of getting to a nitty-gritty of this Christ life, aren't we? I mean, we're getting right down to a part that uh, kind of hurts. Have you ever felt like you're ready to go depart to be with the Lord? You ever think that's going to happen? You ever have a feeling for that happening? Uh, maybe you haven't. I did. I had that very feeling. I had the feeling <laughs> that he wasn't going to let me come back. I knew just as much that I was right in front of him and he was, as it was, scratching his head, what am I going to do with Litzman? Mm -hmm. And you know, that was the most blessed, most peaceful moment I've ever had in my life. I cannot explain it. It would have been far better to be with the Lord than to come back. But he sent me back. And it's as if he sent me back and said, I'm sending you back to finish what you started, to clean up some of the messes you made. It was just that clear to me. So since that time, I have never been afraid to depart. Because I know when I depart, it's his choice. It's his choice. And the way I depart, I'm going to trust him. Because he's in control. So Paul said, I've got a problem here, and my problem is whether to depart or to stay here with you. Now in his heart, he had such a love affair going with Christ that he had rather go than stay. What about you? Have you ever had that much of a love affair working that you'd rather go and stay? I don't mean that you're crowded by circumstances and situations and it'd be easier to go than to face them. I mean just pure love affair. No circumstance big. No, no devil forcing you. But have you just ever had a love affair so great with the Lord you just like to go with him? Like Enoch, go out walking with him and finally just say, Lord, I'm going to walk on home with you instead of going back to my house. Have you ever had that desire? That's what Paul says. But then Paul had another force of love for God. And this other force of love for God took into account that one day God offered his only begotten son, took him to Calvary, let him be killed, stood back while he bore the sins of the human race. He paid the price for souls. And Paul said, Father, since you've gone to such great in to do this. I'm willing to stay here with these people and make known your message. Mothers make that option. There are times their load is heavy and they'd like to go be with the Lord, but something tells them somebody needs to stay here with these children. I need to take care of my family. I need to raise them, so I'll do this. I'd rather go be with the Lord. You can't imagine what being with the Lord is. 
You say, well, I hate to run off and leave these responsibilities. When you go be with the Lord, you won't have that feeling at all that you ran off and left anything. You say, I hate to tell my family goodbye. You won't have that feeling at all, not of hating to tell them goodbye. It won't even enter your mind because you'll be in a new body and your mind will be quickened by that new body and you'll be in the presence of God for which you were created to be in in the beginning. So you won't have any of those feelings. So when you make the decision that I'll bear up the responsibility of loving and taking care of people, my family, my loved ones, souls, I'll bear up and taking care of. That's a choice Christ in you and me. If Christ really lives in me, if Christ liveth in me, and me to live is Christ, then I'm willing to stay here and do what he wants me to do. You got that feeling? Point number six. Verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one man, striving together for the faith of the gospel. If Christ is really your life, then it's going to affect your actions and your conduct, and you'll do what is right in God's sight. You'll please him. He said, whether I come and see you or not, when I hear of your affairs, my prayer is that you'll stand fast. Now, what he's saying in the word conversation, we'll deal with stand fast in our last point. But what he says in the word conversation, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel. He's saying, let your daily walk be according to to what is your understanding of the gospel of Christ? I can't make this clearer to you than to keep saying it again and again because I think this is something important to ongoing believers. <clears throat> God holds you accountable for what you know. He holds you accountable for what you know. He doesn't hold you accountable for what you don't know. God does not hold you accountable to know everything in this book because I've never met or even read of anybody that knew everything in this book. I met a man one time in Georgia that had almost memorized the Bible. He could quote more scripture verbatim than I'd ever heard a mortal do. But he didn't know all that God meant. I met a man that knew the Bible so well, finest Dake, in fact, that published the Dake Bible. Finus was able to tell you any verse where it was you picked out in the Bible. He could tell you where that verse was. He had the Bible given to him as a gift, but he didn't know all that was in the Bible. I read this stuff now and can see that there was much lacking. Though he was brilliant in many things and God's gift to him, but he didn't know the Bible. Nobody knows it. Nobody knows all the Bible. And God's not going to hold you accountable for all that he said in the Bible, he's going to hold you accountable for what you understand of what he said in the Bible. Does that help you? If a man knoweth to do right, and he doeth it not, James 4th chapter, if a man knoweth to do right, and he doeth it not to him, it is sin. What is a sin? That you didn't know the whole Bible? No, that you didn't live what you did know. Isn't that the only way God could deal with us and be honorable? Because the Bible and his plan, I tell you, I've had much of the plan of God to open to me in this last year after preaching almost 43 years. I've had more of it to open to me, and I've scratched my head and wonder why didn't I see that before? Well, I'm sure now that there's so much more I haven't seen than I have seen. 
So he's not going to hold me accountable for all that. That's my, that's where I grow. That's the joy of growing up in the Lord is finding a whole new, new world in Christ out there. And a greater understanding of the plan of God. Don't ever let anybody shut you off from growing. Religion will do that. Religion will say, no, here's what we believe. This is all we believe. Accept it or reject it, but this is it. You can't be one of us if you don't believe this. Be careful of that because there's so much more, more and more, and that's the thrill. Some people don't want more of God, so let them, let them go to religion. But if you want God, and if you want to be who God created you to be, then you've got to be open to more and more and more and let it grow and grow and grow. If Christ is really your life, then you're going to daily, your conversation becomes the gospel of Christ you know and understand. You can't be like me. You can only be what you know to be. You can't be like Jesus of Nazareth. You can only be what you know to be. Where is honor being what you know? See, everybody is so tricked and lied to by the devil they don't do that. An alcoholic tells me, well, if I could just learn more, no, if he could just do what he knows to do. See, just that simple. If he did what he knows to do. A fellow said to me one time, I can't quit smoking, and he said, I prayed to quit smoking, and I know I ought to quit smoking. Oh, I said, you can live what you know. You put it off. You can live what you know. You know you can quit it, then do it. You know it's wrong, then do it. Because the Christ in you gives you the power to do what is right. you got the power in you to do what is right. It's a matter of love. It's a matter of love. One more point, and I'll be finished. Number seven. It's in this same 27th verse. Whether I come to see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. If Christ is really your life, you can stand fast. What does that mean? Stand, period. You won't quit. You won't give up. You won't fall. You won't give in. You can stand. Now, we've got a lot of people who say, I just can't live the Christian life, just too much temptation. It's really the opposite of that. You can stand. You can stand anywhere because it isn't you that lives, it's Christ. But you see, unless that part of the gospel is preached and men understand it, they'll never stand. You'd be surprised how many people I come in contact with who are saying they can't live for God where they are. I even had a man to say not long ago he couldn't live for God at home because his wife was too ungodly. I have plenty who tell me, pray for me, I'll get another job. I can't live for God on, the, on this job. Kids come to me in school and say, how do you expect us to live for God in these ungodly schools? You know what all that is saying? They don't know Christ is in them. They're still living their own life. They're still trying to make it on their own. I tell people who are in ungodly places and want to leave them that that takes Christ out of that ungodly place when they leave. See? A lady came to me not long ago and she said, I got a bad marriage, prayed I can get out of it. I said, have you asked God to help you stand in the liberty wherewith he set you free in that marriage? Now I don't don't mistake me, and I make statements like that, and people get all worried about them. I don't, I don't want to see a woman living with a man that beats her, and I don't want to see her living with a man that's an alcoholic and doesn't want to change. That's two things I draw the line on. I didn't say to divorce him, but I just said don't live with him. Get away from him. Then if you have to divorce him, you have to. 
but I don't want to see a woman misused. But I don't want to see us misuse Christ either. My point is that there's no hell Jesus can't serve God in. Amen? You remember this little gal named Joni in the wheelchair? I don't know her life. Erickson? Is it Erickson? Anyhow, you know her story? She, she got with charismatic people at the beginning of her accident when she was first lame. And they prophesied she's going to be healed and she trusted God and she believed the Lord and nothing happened. So she needed a real miracle to take place in her thinking because that was a bad trip. She could see that God, at least to that time, wasn't going to heal her. And after all she had gone through at that point. And so she had to shift from a God that could heal her to a moment that God was not going to heal her to another place where she would glorify God in her body. So she started writing with her toes, I believe, wasn't it? Painting with her toes. Glorifying God in her body. You see, to stand is something you can do because he that is in you is greater than anything that's against you. You can stand. You're not going to fall over. You're not going to be defeated. Once the mind is renewed to see that it isn't me, it's him. Folks, I believe that. I believe you can stand. I believe you can stand against anything. You can stand for anything. So this, this whole first chapter is divided into truths that if Christ is your life, you can stand. You can make it. You can overcome. You can't be defeated. You're more than conqueror. All of that in the first chapter. From a man that was in a very straightened circumstance, in the balance between life and death, some of you may be like that. You may be in the balance between life and death, but you can stand. You can walk in Christ every day, and you can stand. Sometimes I don't do it very prettily. Is that a word? There's nothing beautiful about it. Sometimes I know my testimony is rotten, but it's all I got at that moment. Sometimes I'm not very good at living what I say. But I'm sincere as I know how to be. I fail, even though I'm sincere. But then I'm quickened by the Christ that is in me. And you may have to take refuge sometimes in Isaiah, what is it, 58? Where he said there was no beauty about him that any man would desire him. No beauty about him. Jesus was like that one time in his outer form. Men looked upon him and couldn't believe in him as a God at all. They may look at you and there be no beauty about you, but your relationship is with the Father. We're in fatherhood now because we're direct offsprings with knowledge. And your relationship is with him. Amen. Well, I better quit. If I don't quit there, I may never quit. So much for this first chapter. May God speak to your heart from it. And may this life ever continue to grow. Well, i got to hand it to you. You're the best group I've ever seen here. God love you. Reach over and take a neighbor by the hand, will you? Take him by the hand and... Kind of look them in the eye and say, I see Jesus in you. Amen. I see Jesus in you. In your life and all that you do, I see Jesus in you. Amen. I see Jesus in me. I see Jesus in me. God 
love you. God love you. Till we meet again, God bless you. <laughs>